Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Jamf After Dark podcast, a podcast to introduce you to the people at Jamf, learn about what we're up to when it comes to managing and securing Apple devices, along with what is happening in the IT landscape. I'm your co-host, Kat Garbus, joined by co-host Sean Rabbit. I love how there's this like nice calm voice that starts this podcast off, and then you get the chaos of me showing up here. So, Kat, how are you? Did you enjoy your JNUC? I enjoyed JNUC. Um, I think maybe I'm the calm before the storm, the, sh- the storm of Sean. But <laughs> that's, that's... I, I got to go to Vegas immediately after going to Nashville, and I, was, I, I had a real-life actual moment where I could determine which one was louder. And I, I, don't, I think they're tied now at this point. Like, you, you go down there to Na- downtown Nashville, and it's like just noise from every, every corner of the room. I, I needed my AirPods updated before that point, so I could have used it as a, as a nice uh, set of earplugs or something. But now they finally have released 18.1, so now I can use that, so... Yeah, you were in Vegas for Octane, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, Octane was like the week after JNUX, so uh, it, it, that was a that that's a lot. <laughs> that's that a, is lot. a lot. It's a lot. But you know, AirPods are great. I love them. So. I love them too. You know what I wanted to pay tribute to today? The iPod. Twenty three years ago today. Oh yeah. Apple released the iPod, which I, I think is exciting. I love my iPod. I, I didn't have the very, very first generation. I had the, I think it was the 20, uh, 20 gig right after. It was 20 gig, 20 meg. I can't even remember. How long? It's been 23 years. <laughs> it's been 23 years. Some of us, I think, burned CDs on LimeWire for the very last time and didn't know. I feel like burning CDs is a lost love language. That's just my thoughts. But I think if, if someone really cared about you, they burned you a CD because they took time to compile some music you might enjoy and then also likely went on LimeWire where there were lots of threats and things and risked their computer's health to entertain you. That sounds and, terrible. Well, I love the iPod. The iPod did. I think we all we all burned something uh, for the very last time and we, we didn't know it yet. That but. LimeWire software sounds like a real threat to max cat it was a threat to everybody regardless of max or windows but it was a threat we should probably talk about threats to max today so let's talk about champ threat labs we got there in the end kids that's remember we are professional podcasters this is how this works um Sharon bradley is with us today say hi hello everybody and uh yes those are beautiful pivot points well done <laughs> <laughs> we, we do this professionally. Just I get paid to do this, which is shocking and and surprising to many people. Jaren, thanks so much for being here today. For those who are brand new in maybe listening or haven't even heard much of Jamf Threat Labs, what is it? Yeah, so Jamf Threat Labs is uh, made up of a, a group of individuals, essentially, where our uh, our our job is to you know. Uh, we're dedicated to finding threats that are in the Apple ecosystem and making sure that our customers are protected from those threats. And that can go across, you know, various products, um, uh, different teams working on on different types of threats, right? Like uh, the, my team, for instance, is, is focused specifically on Mac OS. Uh, you know, we have individuals that are looking at also, you know, network data, um, looking at iOS. Uh, so it's just basically it's, uh, one greater team kind of, you know, fighting the, fighting the bad guys. So, yeah. I mean, what does that look like in a normal day there? You know, it, are you just like surfing pirate Bay constantly looking for new <laughs> things or like what, what are we doing here? Uh, LimeWire actually. It's all LimeWire, LimeWire all the time. All yeah. day. Yeah. I only <laughs> obtained my media legally. Thank you very much. I had the iTunes store on there. I was a good boy. I'm, yeah. ah. See, you're, you already got it figured out. No, it's, uh, yeah, um, well, the Pirate Bay is a great example of a fantastic place to find malware, uh, even even for, you know, the Mac OS environment and the Apple environment. Um, but no, like, we don't just sit there going through that. Um, that's not to say we haven't before. Uh, in fact, you can go back to some earlier blog posts we did where um, 
Uh, it was probably about two years ago at this point. You can look on the Jamf Threat Labs blog. And one of the things we did was we found an interesting piece of crypto jacking malware and we had uh, kind of traced back its uh, uh, the version we were looking at. Um, we clearly found was malicious and was doing some really shady stuff uh, coming packaged with a pirated version of Final Cut Pro. Um, and then uh, essentially we kind of went through Pirate Bay and found all the historic versions of that uh, Final Cut Pro that had been uploaded by the malware creator and just kind of were able to tell this story of uh, of this malware and the changes it had gone through <laughs> through different iterations. So um, although, although that was probably thrown at a, out as a joke, that is something we've actually done is just go across Pirate Bay looking for malware um, in the Mac OS world. Um, malware comes, you know, constantly is distributed through pirated applications. Uh, so that is that is one thing we do. We keep an eye out on on pirated applications to find where some of the newer malware is. Um, but but no, uh, throughout the day, we're doing a lot more than that also, right? Uh, we do a lot of surfing across what's out in the wild um, in terms of, you know, you can do virus total searches. Uh, you can see what's being uploaded there. You can have rule sets uh, for malware that are kind of running in these large databases and get an alert when one of those goes off. Um, so uh, on on top of that, we're doing a lot of tool development. Uh, we do we do a lot of different things on the team. Honestly, uh, there's uh, when you're when you're kind of on a, a research heavy team, uh, options are uh, options are not limited. <laughs> so uh, it's more about finding you know uh, what what's this project going to be for the next month? What are we going to try and like dedicate our time to, and then just kind of dive in deep on it. So. Yeah. How did we get founded? Like what, how did we get a Jamf Threat Labs at Jamf? Like what, what, what's the origin story there of, yes, we need a Jamf Threat Labs to help with this. From, from the, yeah, from the perspective of like, why, why do we exist? Right. Like, um, so if you kind of, if you look at the market share of Apple over the past couple years, um, we, we had this thing going for a long time where you were considered inherently safe, right? If you were, if you were on an Apple device, right? And that went on actually for quite a long period of time. You remember even the old commercials, right? I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, like I'm a Mac, I don't get viruses. Meanwhile, Judge John Hoffman or whoever it was is sitting there coughing, saying he's got millions of viruses and and, and Justin Long is saying, oh, well, I don't have that problem, right? Like, like it goes back to even Apple claiming like we're, we're safe on this side, um, which was, was a bit of a stretch. That wasn't a hundred percent true, but overall it wasn't that big of a stretch. If you had a Mac, you were probably safe from like 99% of malware that was out there. Um, and a lot of that I think just has to do or had to do at the time with market share um, as stuff kind of shifts as more developers, especially are kind of getting their hands on Mac, right? If, if you're an attacker who's going after a critical computer that might have access to a lot of different things, um, then you might be going after a developer. The odds are high that if you're going after a developer, they might be on a Mac and you got to come ready. Like your tool set has to be equipped for that. So I think as this market share has shifted a little, we've seen more uh, Apple devices in the work environment. Um, so have we seen a shift of malware uh, to the Apple ecosystem. Uh, and that's kind of hence, you know, why, why we were created. <laughs> I also liked your Freudian slip, by the way, of jo Judge John Hodgman. You know, tell me what podcast, <laughs> podcast you listen podcast, to. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even just go John Hodgman, went straight to the judge. Judge, Judge John Hodgman. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, those, those were fun podcasts. I haven't listened in a while, but those were always fun time killing podcasts. It's good stuff. We Definitely not stolen any jokes from them in the past there. Sure. <laughs> um, so we have the threat labs, which number one, I think is kind of cool because it kind of just reminds me of the pure science world of like Bell Labs back in the day where there's just people out there looking for stuff uh, for the sake of looking for stuff. And that's 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 useful and, half, and, and good. Um, but let's say that I'm somebody who wants to give Jamf money. Where do I actually see your work showing up in products that we, we create? What, what do you affect? What, uh, where, where does it end up? 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So essentially, um, a metaphor, though maybe not perfect, that I've used before is essentially like a like a car and, and fuel type situation, right? Like you go out and buy the the sweetest car in existence, right? You go grab me a McLaren or whatever, uh, and put it in my garage, and like it'll look sweet, like it's there, it's doing stuff, it's well designed, but um, until something's actually feeding it, right? Fuel, like it's not, it's just gonna sit there, it's not doing anything. So. Uh, kind of similar to that, right? We have, uh, we have some great engineers that are building some awesome stuff here at Jamf um, that take, uh, take content and are able to act on that content. So um, all that design and all that work that gets done is awesome and well packaged by Jamf. And then our team essentially provides that content that it's feeding off of. So for example, um, like that could be detection indicators, right? Like maybe that's uh, malware hashes, for example, like we keep a giant database of that and that feeds out into the product that, uh, that is constantly, uh, going out to our customers when we update those rules, uh, same for team IDs, like malicious signing information. Um, the product feeds on that as well. And then the last thing from the static perspective that we call like YAR rules, which is like a very, uh, kind of standard way to do signature matching uh, against malware. Uh, we we sort of we manage all those things on the static side, and the product takes those and does really cool things with them. But without without that content, the product doesn't quite know what to look for. So that's essentially what what we're doing under the hood to uh, provide customers with you know um, a, a working a working product. I'm curious. Obviously, we've got. Jam Threat Labs, as we've been discussing, we have security solutions that we're taking that work from testing, putting it out there, supporting customers with solutions like Jam Protect, for example, and uh, Jam Executive Threat pro uh, Protection. But I'm curious, how do we compare to other security solutions in the marketplace? Obviously, we're not the only one that's out there, but what makes us different and how does the Threat Labs support that? Yeah, what what certainly sets us apart, like most notably, um, I think to to a lot of people, is the fact that we're entirely Apple based. You know, like we we do have like small pockets where where uh, where like on the mobile side we might be looking at Android security stuff also, and the the Android like threat landscape. Um, and yeah, maybe we care a bit about the Windows threat landscape too because that tells us things. But at the core, like we're a team dedicated to the Apple ecosystem, which I've worked um, many jobs uh, in many other places prior to, you know, coming to Jamf where um, like my, my interest was always in the Apple side, but because there's such this, this big focus for security on the Windows side with all these massive companies running big, like Windows, you know, like infrastructure across the environment, like um, a lot of the effort from different products gets put there. It gets put on the Windows side. Uh, because the market share is bigger and then everything's kind of a port to the Mac side. Um, and we don't have that problem. We're able to build something and design something specifically to run uh, for Apple. Um, and, and that's Apple first. And I honestly, like to me, that's always been the big difference maker, both like for the product as well as like in my day-to-day -day work where I get to focus solely on that. So, and I think that shows in a number of different ways when it comes to um, the detections that, that we're able to produce. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, there's no point to looking for an EXE file on a window on a Mac, you know, it's like, great. Congratulations. You've that's correct. I, like you could, you could make a couple arguments and like, if you want this ultra visibility, yeah, sure. Maybe, uh, maybe you want to know if a Mac is being used as, um, as like a, you know, a, a pivot point, uh, for, for like a windows environment, which, which would be a really strange thing to do, but could you do it? Yeah. But are you going to, uh, destroy your alerts probably with false positives, like in order to try and get to that point? Yes, you are. And I've, I've been at companies where that's the case where you're looking at different, um, you're looking at computers that are identifying threats, maybe through some different, um, like email servers, uh, or, or somebody downloaded an attachment, that attachment was an EXE, and you're flagging that like crazy, uh, and you're doing that entirely on Macs. Like your time, my time's kind of wasted sifting through all these alerts when really they don't mean anything on those Apple devices, right? Like what I want to know about is on my Apple device, is Apple malware present? 
<laughs> and we get to we get to kind of just scope in on that. It's, so. it's uh, going slightly off topic, but I think that's the biggest complaint that I hear from people is like they're going through their their sim or their seam or however you want to pronounce it. I don't care. I'm not going to get <laughs> yeah. in a religious argument about this. This is fine. This is fine. Uh, but it's just like there's all this stuff that people are collecting in there for no good reason. And uh, no. I'm just going to go off for a second because I love <laughs> one of our products. I, I love I love Jamf Connects. It's got the privilege elevation feature in it. But I have been asked so many times by people at this point, it's like, well, I want to know everything that they did when they had advanced privileges. Like, why? Don't you just want to know when something bad happens? <laughs> like, you're just filling up Splunk with more gigabytes of data that's never going to be looked at. Stop yeah, it. yeah, and and visibility into a particular event that occurs like is important, but if you're creating a needle in a haystack situation for yourself, that is also a problem, right? As well as if you're, you know, going way over budget on data that's never going to be used. Like there is a balance and it's kind of a, a notable thing in security is how do you strike that balance? Uh, and that's kind of unique to uh, unique to every different environment. So, yeah, but. So how do you know for the team when you find something new? Speaking of all yeah. this data that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh that's a good question. Um, a lot of times, uh, one, one of the biggest indicators that we generally find is, is usually, you know, we're, we're pretty heavy into virus total, just like almost any kind of threat research company is we use virus total pretty heavily to, um, uh, to, to kind of measure how well known something is or not. Uh, and, uh, if, I don't know if you're a listener, if you've never used virus total, just, you know, go there and plug a hash in and you'll get a report on if that hash is thought to be malicious by a bunch of vendors or, uh, thought to be clean. Um, so obviously a pretty good indicator of if this is new or not is if you go to virus total and you find something that's entirely labeled clean. Um, so when we're doing kind of a report, we'll usually include that information. Like, like we know this is new because nobody really seems to know about it, right? Like nobody's really talking about this, despite the fact that it's been sitting here and it's been scanned by vendors and nobody's really certain. Um, it's kind of that, um, it, it's a long running problem in security where for a lot of people to know something is malicious, it first has to be out there in the wild and somebody kind of has to pick up on it, right? It's, it's again, like when it comes to static based detection of malware, it's kind of the long running problem. How do you know something's malicious if you've never, if you've never seen it before and nobody else has flagged it? Like you got to be the first one, right? So, um, so we have a number of different ways that we go about doing that. Um, and a number of different ways that we go about finding that, uh, that initial malware, um, that could be through behavioral detections, which a lot of people are familiar with, um, uh, those that might be using Jamf Protect, right? We can um, we can see uh, we can see things happening on the system, and we can look for ways when systems or executables are behaving in a strange way. Like uh, I don't know, an easy one is maybe an executable goes and it modifies your proxy settings, um, and it points that proxy setting to the local host. Right, this is kind of a malware has done this in the past in order to like basically route uh, re route data in a unique way where it goes through like a, a local server that points to a that points to a, a remote proxy server somewhere like that. We've seen all kinds of strange stuff where the attacker ultimately puts himself between um, uh, as a way to intercept all the traffic on the system. Right. It seems and, like, like there's. Can, it's almost some sort of framework of uh, of uh, attacks that you might have. Up there. Is that, that's what <laughs> there, I'm hearing. Yes, yes. There's, I mean, MITRE attack framework is is a great way to kind of learn about the different threats that are out there and the different actions that some malware has taken and stuff like that. Uh, and we try to we try to categorize our detections into that framework so that they're a little easier to understand and look up. Um, but uh, basically, it's it's. Some of those behavioral detections, uh, when you find an interesting executable, like maybe that gets done by some proxy software somewhere, um, and that's normal, right? Like that's for you to determine. But maybe it gets done by an executable that's not signed by a developer, it's running as hidden, it's in the temp directory, I don't know, a number of different factors. Like you can look for suspicious indicators that an executable is behaving strangely, uh, and that's one way we do it. Um, 
another way to try and identify these things. I mean, we have, <laughs> I should say we have a lot of ways, um, but uh, the behaviors are one way. The static stuff I kind of mentioned is another. Um, if you write a rule for malware and there's ways to kind of look inside files, right? And um, look for certain strings or well-known attacker strings inside of files. Um, and we will kind of run our rules on a daily basis over these databases and uh, see if anything new comes back or see if anything clean comes back for something that we believe should be like, if this little indicator is in there, it's probably not clean. Um, so that, that'd that be another way that we go about doing it. Um, there's actually some really good, uh, we, we uh, if, if you weren't at JNUC um, and you're waiting for the videos to come on, you know, YouTube, um, we did a couple Threat Labs talks this year uh, on just some of our internal tooling like the with the goal of kind of like uh revealing some of the 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 black box that is threat labs <laughs> uh we we just did some talking to the tooling of um that we've been working on and that we use uh in order to creatively categorize and uh try and identify new threats one was called uh harvest uh it's a tool we created called harvest and one is called titan um, and you can find uh, when those when those talks go public, you can go find those and kind of learn a bit more about them. So just to kind of recap, we do some testing. We maybe found something. We kind of look at it against what's out there, how it behaves, the report. How do we let the world know? Like Jamf Labs or Jamf Threat Labs found something. How, how do we put it out there to inform the community there's a new malware that's been found. We found it. What what are the what's that like? Yeah. So when we find something that's brand new and we think um, that uh, the the world should probably know about it, right? Like we do generally try to blog about that piece of malware. Some of that might depend on how much time we have, um, but uh, usually we try to set the time aside to say, "Hey, this is something brand new. Like if anybody's getting hit by this, like whether they're a Jamf customer or not, we think." We think everyone should know about this. Other vendors should know about this and other people should be kept safe. Like the, the fight in cybersecurity, ultimately, you know, regardless competitors or not, like it is a greater fight that we're all trying to fight. So, um, so we will take that malware that hasn't been discovered before um, or, or that we, you know, have just recently discovered and we'll blog about it. We try to put the details um, of what it's after as well as um, how it gets onto systems uh, what it, what it, uh, uh, what its ultimate objective is. Um, for instance, we've been blogging a lot recently, uh, about, uh, the, the DPRK, um, making different attacks into the crypto industry. Uh, and this is something that the rest of the security community is observing as well. Um, and is also releasing a lot of different blog posts on as we continue to find out, you know, what they're up to, who they're after, and we try to equip these companies better to, to know what to look for so that they don't get hit super hard. So um, all that to say, I think the answer to your question is probably just the Jamf Threat Labs blog. <laughs> uh, and if you're not familiar with that, you should definitely uh, you should definitely check it out to kind of get an idea of what we're up to and some of the discoveries that we've made. I wanted to circle back on something you said earlier, because we've talked about some of the testing, things like that. We've discussed things being found on the Internet. Um, what if it's not on Pirate Bay? You know, like how, how else are we discovering threats that are out there that impact the Mac community? Yeah, if it's not something that came from Pirate Bay, you know, it's um, it's something that there, there's a number of ways we have to, to hear about different malware. Some might be through, um, uh, again, database feeds that we have where we're able to do scans of and identify those. Uh, some could be word of mouth where we might have somebody that says, uh, hey, I've I've got something strange on my computer. I don't know the first thing about looking at it. Would you mind taking a look, <laughs> right? Um, or we might have people in the industry, close contacts in the industry that uh, are uh, professionals at you know doing, doing reverse engineering on Windows malware, but uh, don't really have the time or effort to go learn how to do that for, for Mac malware. 
um, and they might, you know, just pass it off to us and ask if we can help out. Uh, so that, so we have a number of different ways of finding threats um, uh, that that aren't just through like scouring the internet. Um, but yeah. so people are just yeah. dropping USB keys in the parking lot, and you're just picking them up <laughs> randomly. That, that's what I that's what I got off that. So not unheard of, not unheard of. Maybe unheard of, uh, like for me in my personal life, but certainly is an actual attack technique used in very very uh high profile attacks i yeah. would love to know if anyone's actually got by, caught by that at defcon before but you know, that's just <laughs> that's just me I mean, uh, i'm gonna go off script and pull a sean do we <laughs> do we have like some mac graveyard of macs we've just toasted by testing malware on them is there like this secret like graveyard of at jamf of max <laughs> that just we put malware on it to test it and it's no more oh i'd love uh, to know that <laughs> to my knowledge no uh but i i can follow that up by saying that we do have uh so for each one of my employees i uh i give them a mac mini essentially like it's a separate mac mini you know if they're doing everything correctly run it on a separate network like this should be isolated uh, from from your environment, uh, and it's for the specific purpose of detonating malware, right? Um, now, the reason we can get away with this is because APFS snapshots exist. We call this running malware on bare metal, essentially, um, where you actually detonate it on the machine. And this, honestly, is my preferred way of doing it because uh, a lot of malware, when it comes to virtual environments, will run some checks. Like, you detonate the malware, the first check it does is like, okay, am I in a virtual environment? If I am just exit and don't do anything because nobody's going to run whatever this, whatever this attacker has created, like nobody's just going to be running it in a virtual environment unless it's a, you know, reverse engineer of some type. Um, and there's ways to get around that. There's ways to open that in a decompiler debugger and, and get around those techniques, but it is extra steps that nobody really wants to take. And if you're using like just a normal Mac mini, and it's an official computer, the malware will have no idea. Um, so that being said, we also detonate in virtual environments sometimes um, because they're very easy to open malware, detonate it, and then close it. Um, so that's definitely something we do also. But overall, um, uh, the Mac Mini is a fun way to do it. And some of us will run that malware or, or infect the system um, in, in a thousand different ways before we actually perform the reset. But it's, it's all in the... Nice. You know, it's all in the mentality of research. We we did had a running bet going on if it was going to be Buffington, myself, uh, Ward, or Goldbig that was going to blow up their Mac Mini first by the number of times that we had to wipe the drives on it there <laughs> in the CE team. So um, we haven't yet, as far as I know. I, I, I mean, I haven't burned through the the flash drive yet on this thing, but you know, it's. I'm sure that the number of times that you got to whip open uh, Apple Configurator is. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yes. I will say if you're doing the, if you're detonating on a Mac mini like malware and you have to reset the snapshot, like it does require going into, you know, does require going into maintenance mode. You got to hold the power button down, get back. It's like it, it is kind of a pain compared to resetting a snapshot, but uh, there are certain benefits to it from a malware perspective. So uh, uncompensated product endorsement, Tim's uh, DFU blaster, greatest thing ever. Just press button in it. It puts it in the DFU mode for you automatically. It's pretty nice. You just got to plug a oh. USB-C cable in the right ports, and it just does it. It's, okay. Uh, that sounds yeah. incredibly useful. It's uh, <laughs> The guys at Two Canoes right, wrote that one. So hopefully somebody out there listening to the podcast will think that one's a useful one there. So yeah. um, so let's just say that I'm uh, – it's it's cybersecurity month and beautiful October here in, uh, when we're recording this podcast. Um. I, I'm your average corporation that uh, has, you know, 25 plus computers. What what should they be doing for best practices for security? So what's the opposite of what you should be, what what you do? Yeah. So so essentially, uh, compliance reporter is something that's built into the product. Um, and which can, product is that? Is that is that uh, Jamf Trusted Access? Is that a SKU? <laughs> Sorry, it's an inside joke here. Jam, Jam Protect, you got Compliance Reporter built into it. So 
Now I'm just throwing you off. It's great. No, no, now I'm on it. Yeah, now I'm all. We're lost. professional uh, podcasters. <laughs> the compliance is going to go through the different rules on your uh, on your you know essentially your fleet and let you know like which ones might not comply by best practices. Um, again, security is kind of about finding that balance. You you don't want to lock the computer down so much that it's unusable to the user but you also don't want to leave it so open that the doors there are wide open for threats, right? Because like, as we've determined, those are coming around more and more often for Mac OS. Um, so uh, yeah, checking your compliance benchmarks uh, uh, within your organization and trying to determine, you know, what that, what that fine line is you want to set for various settings uh, and what you want to abide by. And that was a cool new feature too at JNUC, which we made the announcement there with the compliance uh, editor built into Jamf Pro instead of being a separate tool, which is uh, uh, available right this very second. If you need to deploy your compliance setting right this very second, just uh, go to trusted.jamf.com. You can grab compliance editor and it'll make all the things. It's, it's amazing. It, it even spits out a PDF that you can just print out and then smack the auditor with it. Like, I don't usually advocate for physical violence, but if you did want to like just whack somebody with a big old PDF of here's what we did, uh, you can, or you can virtually do that by just emailing it to them very politely. That that's also nice. So, but uh, yeah, the fact that it makes that thing that would have taken a security team just weeks of documentation, just boom, press button, win cookie is nice. Jaren, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to share with listeners today? Uh, I mean, again, check out the check out the Jam Threat Labs blog, um, where where we kind of release the different research that we've been doing and the different threats that we've been finding. Uh, I'd just say, like, even from a you know both a cybercrime perspective as well as a um, as well as an APT or uh, advanced persistent threat perspective like uh like the apple ecosystem is a real target now and a lot of people are still kind of stuck on the fact that it it wasn't and and never will be <laughs> um and that's just that's not the case we're finding uh malware on a regular basis uh as well like both both uh malware that's new samples of old malware as well as malware that's brand new novel and you know is is just being uncovered as we go so um yeah i think uh i think just be uh, just be wary and, and, you know, teach your users to, to not click on anything and everything. And yeah, I think that's, that's the perfect message. users. Got to teach my mother to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it was actually a perfect segment. My final question to you was any advice with it being cybersecurity month? What would, what advice would you give? But it sounds like just don't click on it. Is, is maybe the summary Only of that. give your mother an iPad and nothing else. That's the correct answer. That's that's, that's how. Yeah. That's not bad <laughs> advice. I mean, um, but uh, I, I think overall we're, we're seeing two pretty consistent threats right now. Maybe three. Um, one is uh, is pirated apps, and that will always be a threat. Like that is always a spot to find malware, right? So teach your users. Uh, if they're going to download, you know, pirated apps, not to do it on their work computers, like that should be a pretty minimal ask, right? Like it's pretty common sense. Probably um, do it in hopes of, uh, if there's something wrong with this, you know, the, it's going to just toast the Mac, you know, the right. work computer, not my personal one. And, right, you know, right. hopefully there's something on here to stop it from doing bad things. Yeah. Right. And I think <laughs> not downloading pirated apps is probably just the good, you know, period end of advice but like hey let's not put it on the corporate environment but, right but the email said i need this special version of adobe acrobat in order to find out if i <laughs> won the special prize from that nigerian prince no the, adobe flash you mean they need that flash player oh, they need know? that flash player <laughs> I to um, I'll get that but, from the uh, limewire yeah from the limewire the so um pirated apps will always be hot spot to get malware. Uh, another spot right now that you got to look out for info stealers uh, are a huge threat to Mac mm -hmm. OS users. They are, uh, they are tricking users left and right and they're convincing. Um, some, some info stealers, by the way, if you're not familiar with an info stealer, um, it's, it's just basically a, a, a one-time run program that 
steals your whole keychain and, and all your kind of your, your browser cookies, basically anything that could be used to impersonate you, it steals and then it gets off your system. It doesn't stick around. It's just, it runs once and then it's gone. But in that doing sounds so, terrifying. in doing so, it steals everything off your computer that it could ever want. Right. So, um, and, and users are falling for that. And that's because some are targeted requests. Like, um, for example, if you're asked for, uh, a job interview or to even be on a podcast, we've seen users get asked to be on a podcast over LinkedIn. Uh, the day comes and they say, please go install this podcast software. The user installs what they think is podcast software, but in reality, it just stole their keychain, right? Like this is, uh, there are convincing, um, there are convincing social engineering attacks that lead to that working. Others so might be don't trust dealers. any emails coming from Merlin anymore. Gotcha. Or, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's yeah. Anything, <laughs> anything that has to be on a podcast, right? Only, no, I'm just kidding. Um, if you saw a call on LinkedIn to join the Jamf after dark podcast, it wasn't <laughs> us. It wasn't us. <laughs> but outside of just the, uh, targeted info stealers are also info stealers that are being hosted within fake apps, even on purchased Google ad space. So for instance, and again, you can check out the Threat Labs blog for this, but Arc Web Browser, for example, a pretty popular web browser now on Mac OS. Somebody had bought a Google sponsor ad for that, um, that was an attacker. And then they created an, a website that looked identical to the Arc Browser website. Uh, but in reality, when you install this one, it steals your keychain, you don't even get a browser out of it, right? Like, and it's very, very convincing. So like, just being careful, um, especially if you see a dialogue that pops up and asks for your password. That is probably an Apple script pop-up. Um, we try to teach even admins not to use that approach because it teaches users that like pop-ups asking for passwords are normal and that should only be normal uh, in very specific scenarios and it should only look a certain way. So um, maybe try to avoid Apple script pop-ups to your users. <laughs> Um, so those are two of the big, um, those are two big items that we're seeing out there, uh, in the wild right now. The third and final would be again, uh, DPRK activity, but those are really targeting, uh, primarily those in the crypto industry. So if you work in the crypto industry and in blockchain, uh, or, you know, any startup or company related to such a thing, like beware, because like you are, people are looking specifically for probably the the power that you hold within that company. So it's all about the would, Benjamins. That yeah, that's right. That would be uh that would be my advice. At least uh from what we're seeing that's hot in the wild right now. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Thanks thanks for being here today. Yeah, Jared, thanks for thanks for joining in and um uh let's not make it till the next uh let's not make it till the next Jnock. We got to see, see each other. You going to be at any uh, shows coming up yet or is still making plans for the end of the year or it's, it's... I will be at the Objective by the Sea conference um speaking and running a training there on threat hunting. Um That'd be a plug, but it's it's sold out, unfortunately. So I ah, can't take ah. on anybody else. <laughs> well, I look forward to the videos. I'm sure that will come out of it. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be doing a, a talk on some uh, data science collaborative uh, research that we've been doing to detect malware using some or, or to uh, kind of categorize malware using some data science techniques. Uh, but outside of that, I that is the final conference I have lined up for the year after a year of or after a couple months of busy conference life. And uh, yeah, we'll be finding out what's next after that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for joining. Appreciate it greatly. Cool. Thanks so much for having me. Kat, that worked out pretty well so far. I'd say. I think so. Sean, do you have an additional tech tip for today? I feel like the biggest tip is just don't click on it. Just, just don't, just click, don't click. That is that is the tip. Well, I, I do actually want to tell you about something new that was announced at Octane. So this is actually part of the Open ID Connect Standards Committee. They're coming up with a new thing with a fun new acronym. It's called Interoperability Profile for Secure Identity in the Enterprise. And it has the coolest acronym ever. It's IPSI. I, it's just like, it sounds like whoopsie, but ipsy. The idea is, is that you got to make sure that you're securing all the things. And 
one of the things that you want to do with that with Jamf specifically, A, make sure that you got single sign-on set up for your Jamf Pro and your Jamf account has been set up to talk to your domain and your, your organization and all that stuff. Um, but the big piece that I, I'm very excited about is we have the ability to send risk signals to other people. So, you know, for a lot of the times, people aren't hacking in, they're just logging in with your credentials. And if your machine does happen to have uh, a problem, uh, we can say to somebody like Okta, hey, um, Drone just found a nasty thing on your laptop and uh, it's got the single sign-on extension for Okta put on here and it's just logging into everything. So maybe you should stop doing that and we can send that signal to Okta. Everyone's going to be start talking to each other uh, it's the Ipsy standard is everyone needs to know the signals coming off of everyone else's stuff. So look forward to that, having more announcements about that soon. And of course, uh, if you do use Okta right now, you can actually use that with Jamf Security Cloud right now. That's your tech tip for today. Thank you, Sean. That was a wonderful tech tip to close out an exciting session. So thank you for that. And I think that concludes today's podcast. That's it. Yeah, it's now the only thing left is to get paid. That's right, because we're professional podcasters. So Jamf After Dark is a podcast from Jamf and is copyright 2024, all rights reserved. Technical details and product offerings may change at any time. So always check jamf.com for the latest information on our products and services. You can reach out to us if you have any questions or comments or even suggested show topics. And of course, we love fan mail. Simply send a friendly email to info at jamf.com with the subject line attention to the podcast. We are also a sponsor of the Mac Admins Foundation and a whole bunch of jamps are available on the Mac Admins Slack channel. Of course, if you need support, visit support.jamf.com to open a ticket to get your technical questions answered. Very special thanks to our guest this week, Jaron, and uh, very special thanks, as always, to our audio engineer, Merlin, who you should never trust when he sends you an email. That's fine. But uh, to the m M&M team, Merlin and Martin, we appreciate you keeping us sounding great. Until next time, for Cat Garbus, I'm Sean Rabbit. And for Sean Rabbit, I'm Cat Garbus. We'll catch you after dark again. And just don't click on anything. Just don't, just don't click on things. Good night. Give your mom an iPhone.